So yes, so there will be a 50 point activity again that I'm going, it's something that you will print out and do by hand and bring it in or print or actually download it. You can type on it or before you print it out. Um, did y'all tell me, are y'all the class who told me that you would prefer to have like a Dropbox and Blackboard so you could submit it in Blackboard if you want to? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so I will, um, so my online <coughs> students, of course, have to submit it in Blackboard that way. So I'll make this, I'll make that uh, doable for you with this one also. So anyway, um, I will probably, I think today is the last lecture that you need to have information so you can ace that 50-point um, project. I'm sorry? Um, I will give you the option. Um, I, most of the time, I don't have my face-to-face -face students um, submit stuff on Blackboard because I have so many students say, I took your face-to-face -face class for a reason because I don't want to do all this kind of stuff on Blackboard. But um, as, my, as I get older and my students stay the same age, <laughs> y'all stay like 18, 19, 20 usually, um, more and more often y'all want at least the option. I'm of turning turning 20 in. in two weeks. 20 in two weeks. I'm scared. 20 on Saturday. 20 on Saturday. I'm scared. You too? <laughs> on Saturday also? Oh my goodness. I'm so scared. I think we're going to have to have donuts and coffee in class. Um, anyway, okay. Okay. Oh, wow. All these 20. So I, pinned, I pegged y'all's age. Okay, okay, okay. Rowdy bunch. Me, me, me. Okay, so this is the last bit of information that you need in order to ace that 50-point um, activity, which is my goal, right? I want you to ace this stuff. So today we're going to look at what poverty actually means. Now, the last time we were together, we had the seven-rung ladder on the board. We actually got a name for each of the socioeconomic classes, right, of that, those seven socioeconomic classes. We got a name for each of them. Um, but, well... Not but, well, only one of the socioeconomic classes had the word poverty as part of it. Which one was that? Working poor. I see one person mouth it. So, and that was not even the bottom rung of the ladder. That was the second up, right? Second from the bottom, or first from the bottom, however you count it. But anyway, um, so yeah, so we even have the word poor in that socioeconomic status name. So we have underclass, working poor, working class, and before we ever get to middle class. So the activity that you did, the hidden rules among classes, when, you're, when you were going through that checkbox for, for poverty, well, we really don't know which of those social classes in the United States correspond to poverty. We, we kind of can guess that middle class corresponds to middle class, but it might overlap into working class, one below. It might overlap into upper middle class, one above, okay? So um, it's kind of, what I'm saying is, it's a gray, there's a gray area. I have that seven rung ladder with clearly there are seven steps on that ladder, names for those steps, but there's a lot of gray area in between them, okay? So usually, instead of learning that there are seven socioeconomic classes in the United States, usually we know the words poverty, middle class, and wealth, right? And we just have to like figure out how to divide those things. But poverty is kind of the, the hardest one to define. As a matter of fact, some of you were talking about how there's not in the yellow box or in the glossary, a definition of differing styles of life or average standard of living in, um, in our sociology textbook. Another thing that you will not find in our glossary, you will not find in our textbook reading part is the word poverty with a definition. You won't see that. We could look in Webster's Dictionary or dictionary.com, whatever dictionary you people these days use. You'll see the word poverty in there. I don't even know what the definition is in Webster's Dictionary. In sociology, we can't really define it. We can have that list of, that checkbox list that y'all went through to see if you understood any of those life experiences that were on that list, but we don't have a definition for the word poverty. We do have something called the official, how do you spell official? Like that? Mm -hmm. The official poverty line. Okay, the official poverty line. So if 
you've got this seven rung ladder here. Somewhere in this seven rung ladder somewhere, there could be an official poverty line. Maybe there. Maybe there. Sorry, I need to move over maybe a little farther so y'all can see it. Maybe that is where the official poverty line is. But we do define this. The official poverty line is the minimum amount of money I'm going to use the dollar sign to mean money. Just remember there's lots of different currencies in the world with different symbols, so I'm just using the dollar sign to mean money. The official poverty line is the minimum amount of money a family of four needs to be at a subsistence level in their area. What subsistence level mean? Um, stable. Stable. What does subsistence mean? In anthropology, it means a food getting strategy, right? Uh, more generally, um, in anthropology, it means a strategy for survival. Food and potable water is a huge part of that, right? But in general, subsistence means survival from day to day. What, what sociology term have we already discussed this semester that has the word subsistence in it? When did we first talk about that? The first day we got on this subject, you're absolutely right. Flip back to your notes. And the word is... The term is life chances. That's right. Life chances. There is a major concept from day one of this topic. Life chances is a key thing that, you need, that you're going to be using, that definition of life chances, um, while you are acing the 50-point activity that you're going to do for, for next week. I'll, I'll post it this week, but you'll turn it in next week. Anyway, the official poverty line is the minimum amount of money needed for a family of four to be at subsistence, which is survival level, we're not talking about electricity, remember? We're not talking about unlimited data plan. We're not talking about even a Honda, let alone a Mercedes. We're talking about subsistence. What's required for subsistence? What are the basic necessities? Food, shelter, clothing, and potable water. Yes, agua potable. Because if you drink stuff that's not drinkable, you could die. Yes. Water is, I don't know if y'all have heard this before, I'm sure you have, maybe you didn't really understand the ramifications for it socially, but water is a universal solvent. Have y'all heard that before, like in your physical science classes? Water is a universal solvent, which means it will suspend pretty much any kind of chemical, any kind of critter, it'll suspend all kinds of stuff in it. And um, that's what it means, that water is a universal solvent. Um, but for us... Socially, that means that most of the water in the world, unless we, it goes through some kind of treatment process, most of the water is not drinkable to us. And we have to have water for survival. So that's why it's really, really important to say it's potable water we have to have access to. We can't just go to the Arkansas River, which is really close to here, and start drinking. I mean, you can, but please keep a journal for scientific purposes about what happens to you after that occurs, Lake right? Water. Lake water, that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay, so don't, that's not potable, right? It could, it could be fine. You could drink it and you could be fine, but you don't know, right? So that's why you have to have a potable water source. What does this part mean? The, like, are you asking for, like, a literal definition? Well, I mean, how, what is the significance of that prepositional phrase to the rest of this definition? It, because the minimum amount of money that a family of four needs to survive is going to be a different amount from New York City to Los Angeles, California, to Las Vegas, Nevada, to Bryant, Arkansas, to Jackson, Mississippi, etc. <laughs> yeah, it's really expensive. Like housing is super expensive in New York City and, and Los Angeles. Housing in Bryant, Arkansas, not nearly as expensive. Housing in Jackson, Mississippi, not nearly as expensive. 
So the amount of money you need to be at a subsistence level is much less in Bryant, Arkansas than it is in Oakland, California. Okay, so that's what in their area means. If you live in Jacksonville, Arkansas, there are prices for things. There's prices for a one-bedroom apartment. There's pre they're pretty much going to be even from one apartment complex to the next because that's what the market will bring, is that price. So there is, even though we can't define what poverty is, we can define what the official poverty line is, um, and it's a minimum amount of money. So where does this line go on this ladder? I don't know. In Jackson, Mississippi, maybe it goes right there. In Los Angeles, maybe it goes right here. I don't know. We would have to, this is a really, really complex equation that would make your college algebra teacher scared to look at it. It's a really complicated equation because it takes into account prices for all kinds of things that are considered survival necessities in the place where you are. Okay. There's a little bit of additional meaning to the official poverty line that we need to talk about, and that's where the term from the homework comes in, the average standard of living. Who wrote their own definition or figured out what the definition for the average standard of living is? Yes, ma'am. Tell me. Well, we can all help you, so go well, ahead. I said, okay, it's like, you don't have to say what. That's okay, Sarah can help you if she wanted to. Okay, but y'all. Well, no, because it's like uh, how people live or how they choose to live based on their areas. It ha yes, so it has to do with this, air this different area, right? So the average standard of living changes from one place to the next because prices change from one place to the next. So again, we can't say, oh, the average standard of living is, you know, Xbox number this and, <laughs> you know, and higher. No, we can't say that kind of thing. We have to look first at subsistence level stuff. But the average standard of living is the expected, um, the expected access to the subsistence, um, to, I'll say, to subsistence items and other um, typical advancement and um, what's the other word in the, in the life chances? Advancement and comfort. Advancement and comfort items in life. There is an expectation that we assume people have access to certain things, especially if we do. Do we assume not only that people have a home, but do we have kind of a narrow definition of what appropriate, look at my air quotes, appropriate or typical housing is? So apartment, appropriate housing. Duplex, appropriate housing. Van, appropriate housing? Mm. No. When we meet each other for the first time, do we expect your address to be a van down by the river? No. We expect you to have an address of some sort that is permanent. We don't expect it to be a homeless shelter. We don't expect it to be under a, a bridge that everybody knows. We don't expect those things. We expect people to have. You might be able to subsist in a van down by the river, can't you? Sure. You can live there. As a matter of fact, one of my culinary students at the other campus was talking to me about like housing that she's having trouble with, and she's like, you know what? I have this car, and I'm really seriously considering for a few months just living out of my car. But is that the expectation? The expectation is you're going to have a roof over your head. Okay, it's some kind of appropriate, here's my typical or expected roof over your head. Whether it's your parents' house, whether it's a roommate in a dormitory, whether it's something. Like, there's a whole bunch of things that are acceptable housing, but that's the assumption that we make. If we make an assumption that people have electricity, that people have indoor plumbing, 
people can flush their toilet and the stuff in it goes away and you never see it again. Don't we make that expectation? We have that expectation for their standard of lifestyle and people in poverty, middle class, and wealth, like that um, quiz that y'all just took, there are different standards of living that those people experience, differing styles of life. Those quizzes had long lists of things that was described your style of life if you were in poverty, middle class, or wealth. So this standard of living is, when you say average, it's an expected amount of access that you have to stuff an expected amount of ability to pay for certain things that we are supposed to pay for in life. Questions? Okay. So, where's my... Oh, yes, thank you. Somebody take a picture of it. Or, if, or you, do you have it in your notes just like this, Amanda? Yeah. So if you'll just take a picture of your notes, it's usually like closer to it. So, but thank you for, for saying that right now because I was still going to forget. Okay. Okay, so we cannot define the word poverty by itself, but if we put adjectives in front of the word poverty, we can define it, okay? What time is it, y'all? How much time do I have? 10.02. 10.02, okay, good. Yes, I've got at least enough time to do this. Okay, so um, like I said, let me repeat what I just said. So we can't define the word poverty. We've just defined the official poverty line, but I can't tell you concretely, oh, the official poverty line in the United States is right here, because depending upon what area of the United States you're in, that line is going to go all over the place, because the minimum amount of money that you need to have subsistence is going to change from one place to the next. So let's look at, there's three different types of poverty that sociologists do define, but we have to look at three different types in order to get a definition, okay? So one of them is called absolute poverty, one of them is called relative poverty, and the third one, let me put it over here so y'all will be sure to see it, the third one is called subjective poverty. So, absolute poverty and relative poverty have very specific definitions. Subjective poverty, what's the word subjective mean? It's, uh, who, it depends on who views it. Yes, yeah, su subjectivity means that you're going to have a different point of view than I'm going to have. Um, objectivity means it's a pretty standard definition that you can apply to every different case and you can, you can um, use it correctly. These two have very objective definitions, whereas this one, like the name of it, is going to be very subjective. Okay, so let's start with the two objective ones. Absolute poverty, the first thing that you need to know about absolute poverty is that this is a life-threatening situation. Life-threatening. It doesn't have to kill you, but the potential is there if you exist in absolute poverty. Okay, it's not, it's not for sure gonna kill you, but the potential is always there. Okay, the specific definition of absolute poverty is this. It is the inability to provide yourself and or the people who depend on you. If you have really young children <laughs> or really elderly people who depend on you, you're unable to provide yourself and your dependents with a steady subsistence level. Remember, subsistence means survival. That's what subsistence means. That's why in anthropology class you learn that it is a food getting strategy. Subsistence strategy is a food getting strategy. Food is one of the key things that you need for survival. 
food, potable water, shelter. So look at this definition and then tell me in your own words, um, why did I say, before I gave you the official definition, why did I say this life-threatening situation such a thing? Because... Go ahead. So, but what does what does an unsteady subsistence level mean? It's uncertain. You're uncertain whether you are going to be able to have the means to survive. So, for instance, last night that horrible storm blew through and it took down trees, all kinds of stuff. I hope none of y'all had any damage, but um, there was trees down all over. Yeah, it was bad, huh? So, certainly, shelter last night was a big benefit, but I saw on the news this morning that even though people had shelter, um, which is, you know, they were able to, to provide themselves with a subsistence level. I saw on the news last night that somebody in northern Arkansas died, unfortunately, as those storms blew through. I was in New York City one time just before um, Christmas, just looking at the sights, being a country bumpkin in the big city, <laughs> looking at stuff. And um, in the news one morning when we were getting ready to leave the hotel room and go sightseeing, I had the news on in the background and someone had frozen to death on a park bench in Central Park. And they were they were reporting that. So um, that that park bench, you know, that person who froze to death on a park bench, that's the inability to provide yourself with a stable enough subsistence level that it threatened your life and it took his life in that case. I don't remember whether it was a male or a female. I'll just say his. So absolute poverty means that you don't have access to enough food to keep yourself alive and healthy, or your kids alive and healthy, or both of you at the same time. Absolute poverty means you don't have the shelter that's necessary to protect yourself from elements like freezing temperatures, because that can endanger your life. Would that be like Ethiopian? It could happen any number of places in the world. When we heard about, when you were, before you were born, uh, in the news a lot, there was about the, there was a famine in Ethiopia, a terrible drought and a famine specifically in Ethiopia, and, um, where people, a lot of people starved because, the, because there wasn't a reserve of food mm -hmm. and the land that they relied on to produce their food supply on a regular basis dried up and nothing was growing. Cows and goats and all kinds of stuff that they eat were dying too because they need things from the land. So yes, it could be a situational thing like a famine or a drought or some kind of terrible thing that can create a life-threatening situation. Um, one of the most common life-threatening situations, most common situations that can cause absolute poverty in the world is lack of access to drinkable water, lack of access to clean water. That's one of the most common reasons for death worldwide. If you look at the Center for Disease Control, um, CDC is what you'll hear people say, CDC, that stands for Center for D Disease Control. Um, and I think there's also disease control and protection. I think there's a P on the end of that now. Um, anyway, you'll, they always run every year the top 20 killers in, um, in the world uh, that, that contribute to the death rate, to early death rates. And none of the top 10 will say dirty water. You know, it won't say that. It won't say diarrhea, which is the major uh, thing that happens to us when we get dirty water, right? Um, diarrhea is something that is a major um, symptom of all of the top 10 major killers in the world, according to the CDC. The most common thing that diarrhea does to us is it dehydrates us, right? It dehydrates you. You can't live very long without water. So if your water supply <coughs> that you're trying to get rehydrated is the thing that's carrying the critter that's making you have diarrhea to begin with, you can't drink that water and get dehydrated, it's, excuse me, and get rehydrated. It's just gonna continue your diarrhea problem and you're gonna get more and more dehydrated and die. In the military, anybody in the military in here, y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but in the military there's the rule of threes. And you can live three minutes without oxygen three days without water, and three weeks without food, typically, if you started out with the average body size, average hydration, that kind of thing. 
So um, f lack of clean water is one of the reasons why absolute poverty exists in the world. Um, if, if you have medication to help you with your diarrhea, but you take that medication with the water that's making you sick to begin with, Yeah, so um, absolute poverty is a life-threatening situation. On the 50-point the activity, you're going to be asked to read several scenarios about a woman named Mary. And Mary is going to have this life experience, and Mary is going to have that life experience. And if in the, her life experiences you read about Mary is unable to provide herself with clean water to drink, then it's an absolute poverty situation. Now, none of them are that straightforward, right? You're going to have to read and evaluate what the life scenario is, is saying. Um, but uh, absolute poverty is one of the choices for each of those things that you're going to have to evaluate. And always look at this life-threatening situation issue to be um, one of the key factors for choosing absolute poverty about a scenario that you read about. Okay. In comparison, before I take questions, I know some of you might have questions, but before I take questions, let's talk about relative poverty in comparison, okay? Relative poverty is the ability to provide yourself with, um, the average standard, with um, subsistence, but you don't have the average standard of living. This like the Let me finish popular. writing this, and then I'll address that question. Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question, and actually we're going to talk about that. Is, is this, you were, you were asking, is this the most common type of poverty in America, essentially? Yeah, is, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but yeah. Okay, so just a second, we'll talk about that. Okay, so uh, you have the ability to provide yourself and your dependents with subsistence, but you do not have the average standard of living. And since the van down by the river is not the average standard of living, but you can clearly subsist, easily subsist, in a van down by the river. Easy. Is that the expected standard of living that we assume people are going to have when we meet them at campus? Sure. One of the first jobs I had at UALR teaching years and years ago, um, that was back in a time where people were like, oh, I see a gray hair in your hair. <laughs> so there was like one or two, not all this. Now it's like, oh, I see a black hair. <laughs> so it was years ago. But one of the scholarship students who um, I was managing, we found out in the middle of the semester he was homeless. He was homeless. He had chosen to be homeless, but he was looking around um, at different places uh, to live, and sometimes he lived in his car, and sometimes he lived in the, there was this nice um, kind of workout area at UALR that had like showers and all this kind of stuff. Sometimes he was sleeping in there. So he was using the resources he had. He was able to provide himself with subsistence, but he was definitely here because he didn't have the average standard of living. We don't expect you to be sleeping in a sauna in the workout room in the college where you go. But he was able to subsist doing that. He ate fine. He went to class. Brilliant kid. Computer programmer now. He didn't have the average standard of living. If we have feelings of pity, or if we have feelings of awe, or we have feelings of, oh, because of his of how he lived, that's because we're reacting to what our assumptions are about the average standard of living somebody should have. So to your question, Preston, about is this the most common type of poverty in the United States, that's the question that I wanted to ask all of you. Look at these two types of poverty, and you, you tell me, what do, what do you think of these two types of poverty, which one do you think is the most common in the United States? Relative poverty. Yeah. When you were doing that um, quiz, wealth, middle class, poverty, 
the poverty list, I know I've taken it up from you, but the poverty list, did it sound like this poverty or did it sound like this poverty? Relative poverty. Sounded like what you said about like it was bad when we were talking about following the American dream. America has much more to offer as far as accommodable bathrooms and stuff like that, just off the street and stuff. Exactly. So, um, rel so several of you, I'm sure that the video didn't hear all of y'all saying, but I, several of you at the same time said, "Oh, we m the most common poverty in the United States is relative poverty." I agree with you. You're you're correct, um, because even that student who was living in the workout facility at UALR or his car, um, as gross as you and I might you and I might be grossed out to think that you could drink the water out of a faucet in the bathroom someplace. Are you grossed out? Some of us might be grossed out for that, but that's what Amanda was talking about. Back when we talked about the, the American dream, we in the United States have a lot of public facilities like public sewer systems. So here at our school, we can go to the bathroom in here and flush the toilet, and all the stuff that was in there that we won't talk about goes away down the public sewer system, and some somebody someplace somehow stores that stuff, processes that stuff, and contains that stuff so it doesn't contribute to us getting sick or it doesn't contribute to contaminating a water supply that is intended for us to drink, right? So, yes, those kinds of things that we have in the United States available to so many of us um, do contribute to that American dream idea and the ease of getting subsistence level stuff in the United States. However, not all of us have that. Not all of us have access to city water, city sewer, electricity regularly, which means no refrigerator, which means no Wi-Fi, which means no TV, all these different kinds of things. Those those things I just listed off are part of our expectation for what people have in their lives, right? We expect you to have electricity and therefore a refrigerator. But not everybody does. We expect to be able to walk up to a faucet in a house and usable water comes out of it. Drinkable and for cleaning, usable water comes out of it. We expect to be able to flush the toilet, it goes away, whether it's a septic system or a city water. But some places, city water and city sewer don't run out into the country everywhere, do they? Some place you do have to have a septic system if the stuff in the toilet's going to go bye-bye. But it costs money to put a septic system in. So, but don't we have that part of the expectation? Actually, we don't usually think about, where does my poop go when we're thinking about the average standard of living? But... Where does our poop go? We assume it goes away, right? And if it didn't go away, would it contribute to our health or unhealth? Potentially. Yes, absolutely. So the average standard of living is not possible for somebody living in relative poverty, which might include you don't have running water in your house. But maybe you have access to running water because you can go down the street to the gas station or whatever. I'm sure some of y'all, maybe you haven't noticed, but usually at gas stations, someplace, if it's a big gas station, you'll see like a spigot with water somewhere around the gas pump area. That's city water. Most of us would maybe be grossed out drinking out of that because we're spoiled. But maybe you don't have running water in your house, so you poop in a five gallon bucket and you pour it out in the creek behind your house. And when you need water to drink or wash, maybe you go fill up old milk cartons, old, I see, your, I see your face, yeah, wrinkling up our noses thinking about this scenario. But you are providing yourself with subsistence level if you poop in a five-gallon bucket and dump it out in the creek outside. You are providing yourself with a subsistence level if you drive your old Oldsmobile to the gas station and you fill up old milk cartons and bleach cans or whatever you've got with water from the hose that comes out the side of the building for people to use in the parking lot. You are providing yourself with a subsistence level. Is that how you get your water? But if you grew up in poverty, generations of poverty, that's how you know to get your water. Yes? Actually, my... Oh really funny story. My great-grandmother, she was so used to being 
in poverty that when we finally managed to get her in a home, she still chose to do the things that she... Absolutely. So I don't know if if people online could hear, but yeah, the story was my great-grandmother was so accustomed to her daily routine of how to subsist because she had such drastic poverty. She lived so below the average standard of living. She was so accustomed to that that even by the time she had more money resources in the house, she kind of couldn't stop the habits of going and doing whatever she had done before. Yeah, that my, my grandmother and your grandmother maybe are the same person, but yeah, my grandmother was the same way. When her sons grew up and were able to contribute to the household and they had much higher amounts of money to buy higher quality food, my grandmother couldn't, I remember my, my father's story was like, I went to my mother and I told her not to buy that stuff anymore because you know, we were gonna eat better. You know, we weren't just going to have fat back and gravy. You know, we're going to do more than that because we can afford it. And she couldn't get out of that habit of just going straight for the, the cheapest cuts and the same things that she had always made. And they wanted, you know, more nutrition. And they wanted to use their money for that when they were 14, 15, 16 years old, bringing money into the household. So, yeah, it's a, it's a mentality. That's why I had y'all do that quiz for the styles of life and the hidden rules of class, the hidden social rules of class, the hidden norms that you live by day to day of classes. Okay, so um, how am I doing on time? Okay, good. So subjective poverty, so these are objective definitions, right? You can clearly look at these and say, all right, if a scenario is describing a situation in which somebody clearly is doing okay with subsistence, but their electricity is shut off a couple of days every other month or something. That's not your expectation for the average standard of living. So a scenario that said something like that, and I don't know if there's a scenario on the activity that is, is like that. I don't think I'm giving away any information. Um, that would be a relative poverty choice. So you would have to read a scenario, evaluate it. What kind of poverty are we talking about here? Okay? Wait, so, okay. Yeah. Let me just make sure. So like relative, relative poverty would be like, someone's gas was off, but they still had water. So they would need, like, so like, they would fill up water from the sink and just eat it up. Okay, so, so your scenario is relative poverty might be if your gas was shut off. Yeah, so you don't have any heat. So you don't have any heat but you still have an apartment that you're living in, I'm assuming. It, you would need a little bit more information than what you gave me in that scenario. So your scenario gave me like, okay, your water still works, but your heats off. Right. I need a little bit more information okay. um, because maybe, the wa maybe your water source is the gas station down the street but, and the heat in your van that you live in down by the river is not working. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. I need, so we would need a little bit more information. So the scenarios that you will read in the 50 point activity are going to give you that little bit more information. Okay. Yes, sir. Is it very difficult to distinguish absolute poverty and relative poverty? Or Y'all tell me, what do you think? He wants to know, is it difficult to distinguish between these two? Look at the, look at the definitions. Do you think you would be able to identify yeah. yeah. life-threatening versus just you're missing some average perks that people have? Yeah, so um, absolute poverty does not mean you are going to die imminently. It means that the situation you're in is, is life-threatening. It is perfectly reasonable that you could die from a lack of being able to get yourself like you food, get food, potable food. water. Yeah. Would you say? Like you can't get food and feed yourself and nurture yourself like you're supposed to. Do. Exactly. Exactly. Or you have a baby and you don't have enough food to produce enough breast milk to keep that baby alive and the baby dies. Maybe you survive, but you couldn't keep your dependent alive. So that's still absolute poverty because you couldn't, you didn't have enough food yourself to produce enough breast milk for the baby to live. Sad. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. Um, you didn't have enough food during pregnancy to even bring the baby to full gestation. The baby miscarriages. You don't know if you Happens all the time. Food. Yeah. So absolute poverty, there's always the threat that your life could end because of the situation. It's not a guarantee, but yours or somebody who depends on you, their life is potentially in danger because you can't get the proper amounts of subsistence to survive. So if you have food stamps, you're not absolute poverty. 
In, okay, so, so food stamps or WIC or any of these kinds of things um, are precisely there. There are government um, programs precisely there to assist people in the underclass in the United States, the working poor in the United States. So if y'all remember the day that we talked about the seven socioeconomic statuses, um, underclass, working poor, working class are on the bottom three rungs. It's 55% of the U.S. population. The underclass, one of the things that I don't remember if y'all had a question about, but maybe my Tuesday, Thursday classes did, um, what does government assistance mean? Because the underclass was seasonal or temporary labor because I can't hire you regularly, maybe you can't read. Maybe, you know, maybe there's some kind of educational level that's so low that I can't hire you regularly, but when my grass needs mowing, I can get you to operate my lawnmower for me. But I have to do the gas and the oil and stuff because maybe you don't even know the difference in where you put those on the lawnmower or something. So there's, um, I don't remember where I was going with this. What, were, what was the question? <laughs> Absolute and relative poverty, yeah. I know that we're, yeah. Anyway, sorry, that was, uh, that was going to be brilliant. It's just gone. So, um, so anyway, what was your question? Maybe it'll come back to me. Sorry, I'll finish. Sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions. No, that's fine. Oh, it was about food stamps. Yes. And so, thank you. Somebody was supposed to pay attention. Okay, I don't even have a loud noise to get distracted by, and it just goes. Anyway, so yeah, so the food stamps thing. So in the United States, an underclass person has an opportunity for maybe that seasonal em employment three weeks out of the year when blueberries are in season. I can hire you to fill up this blueberry bucket for $5 each bucket you fill. Or maybe maybe a holiday, maybe a holiday. But if you can't read, I don't you know I don't know how to. You can operate my cash register or something. Um, but yeah, it says government assistance is another thing that they rely on for regular support. There's your food stamp situation. So we have a lot of I guess you'd call them safety nets. I'm saying yeah, like but food stamps and Medicaid, and housing food vouchers, food Medicaid, food stamps. Yes, in the United States, we have, that's a good point. So yes, I see what you're saying. So in the United States, we have a lot of safety nets that prevent this from happening and mean that this is the most common type. Yeah, so, um, and even, even other things, not just government programs, but food banks that are run by churches or charitable organizations, um, homeless shelters, soup kitchens, these kinds of things. Yes, things that are available in the United States. Things that are available in the United States, we have, like, like safety nets like that, are in place specifically to help our population never experience this. Someone is still going to freeze to death on a park bench in New York City this winter, unfortunately. But, you know, there are plenty of homeless shelters. If they could have just gotten there, they could have had their subsistence level. Thing? I don't think so, no. You don't think so? No. You are, right, your food, food stamps help with this. Food stamps help with this. A housing voucher helps with this, right? Any kind of assistance like that. The food bank helps with that. It's basically, yeah, like a connection thing. Like that's what's separating you from absolute poverty because with absolute, you don't have anything to help you. I agree with that statement. Absolute, you don't have any resources to access or resources to help you. Um, in relative poverty, you're able to provide yourself with subsistence whether it is through a paycheck you are earning or whether it's through your WIC card getting re-upped every month or what, however you say it, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. So to give a counter-argument to that, what if you don't have a, what if you don't have the ability for those safety nets? Or is, is someone in absolute poverty more prone to being defiant and breaking the rules oh. to get out of that? Do you see what I'm no, saying? No, probably not. I do see what you're saying. And no, uh, this... Being in this condition does not mean you're going to resort to criminal activity to get to this. So there's not a direct correlation to that. That's another myth. Just like the myth that we talked about before I started recording, we talked about the myth that poor people are poor because they're lazy. No. You know, we did this uh, hidden rules of social classes activity for you to see. Here's the style of life in poverty. Here's the style of life in middle class. Here's the style of life in wealth. Um, poor people are not poor because of laziness. Poor people, before, before class, we, uh, before uh, I started recording, uh, we talked about how money was something that was to be spent if you have a, uh, an impoverished socialization process. 
money is something that needs to be conserved or managed if you have a middle class um, socialization process. And money was something, what was the phrase in the, in the wealthy one? I've even forgotten because it don't apply to me, so yeah. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> the other ones oh, do what? Invest, yeah, grow. So it was something like money for wealth is to invest or to grow it or make it work for you or something. Yeah, it's a different kind of way of thinking of these kinds of things. And so, so yeah, that's um, it's not a direct correlation that poverty causes crime. No, no, poverty does not cause crime. So okay, so let's do one more. Um, Subjective poverty, and I think actually you're going to need, we will need at least part of another class period for us to talk about global stratification and what global poverty looks like, um, because that's also a reference that you need, or that's the material that you need to be able to ace that 50-point um, project, okay? So I probably won't give it to you today. I'll probably wait till Wednesday after class um, to actually post it on, on a Blackboard for you, almost said Facebook, <laughs> Blackboard for you. Okay, subjective poverty. Subjective poverty is a situation in which a person feels like they should be farther along with their financial life than they actually are at that point in life. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk, it is, it is vague. So a situation in which a person feels as though they should be more secure or farther along in building wealth That's why it's subjective. Oh. Yes, that's why it's subjective. Okay. <laughs> um, that makes sense. That's why it's subjective, because it's up to the individual. So for instance, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, well, I, I think I told some people were in here just before class started, and I was setting up my computer, and I had a notice on my computer that payday's tomorrow. Yay, right, so payday's tomorrow. Um, but sometimes, uh, still, you know, I'm in my career. I'm not paying for school anymore. Um, I have bills like a mortgage and things like that, and I, got, I went into my career with a master's degree, and now I'm working on my PhD. You know, you do these things because you're thinking, okay, your pay rate is going to be this, and your lifestyle is going to be like this, and yet about a couple months ago, I was waiting for that payday notification on my computer, and I, I said to my husband in a, in a situation where I was frustrated, I was like, when are we not going to be poor anymore? Something like that. We ain't poor. We ain't poor. My husband and I are not poor, okay? He has a truck provided from the company that he works, and we just, after I paid off my student loans, we just bought a Cadillac, and that was my mother's dream. And so that's honestly why I chose one, because we could, I needed a car, and my mom always wanted one. So I'm like, here you go, mama. I've got one now, right? Only reason we can is because my husband's car is, pro is provided from the workplace, right? But you know what? We wanted to go and visit some friends of ours. So we're going to Epcot Center last, last year. We wanted to go. We couldn't. It was too much money. Epcot Center is expensive. I've never been to Disney World. Have y'all ever even been? Yeah. No, I've I'm never so been. You've been? A lot of people, you know, I, as, I kind of I want to do that too. Again, for my dead mama who, you know, probably would have wanted to do that for us if we hadn't been in relative poverty most of my upbringing. But still today, I'm not in poverty. I'm not even in relative poverty. I never have to worry about my electricity being shut off. Never have to do that. I've got, I even still pay for my satellite TV instead of just doing a Netflix thing. You know, I mean, we have extras that we live in. But when, yeah, when my paycheck, my bank account still gets down to that spot where I'm like, five days until paycheck. Ooh, right? I'm like that. <laughs> and so, but and that's not where I thought when I was you, I thought by the time I'm grandma like I am now, that there wouldn't be that. Ooh, paycheck. Let me hold on until then, like there is for you. When I was in college, I had two, three jobs to try to make it, and I still ate ramen noodles all the time. 
But I thought by now that I'm not, I'm not poor, poor. But if I ever have those situations where I think, gosh, when is this going to end? These last few days before the next paycheck when you're like, oh, maybe I can defrost something with freezer burn just to eat. You know? Definitely everyone has this. Well, maybe so. I mean, this is a very common thing for people in working class, middle class, upper middle class. This can vary, this can affect them. Maybe you are in the upper middle class and you've got a house on Lake Hamilton and you've got a house in Pleasant Valley or whatever is a good, that's a good neighborhood here, right? Um, you know, and you have two Mercedes in your house. Maybe you have these things, but if they're all financed, yeah. and you only make this much money a month and all your bills are exactly that amount a month, then you might have all these wonderful things, but you still might feel like crunch. And that's this. I don't know. You'd have to give me the scenario, and based on the scenario you can describe, you would have to argue that. You would have to say, here's a relative poverty situation. The average standard of living would have to be awfully high, I would say. I would, I would guess to be able to say relative and subjective simultaneously. So I would say, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. I mean, if you could, if you could come up with a scenario where you could successfully argue it's relative poverty because of X Y Z, but it's also subjective because of X Y Z, then sure. Yes, sir. Can I give one? Can you give so one that's both? So Who I wants think, to help you? I think so. I'll help. So say someone is living in an apartment. They're able to pay for the apartment, they have internet, they have all this stuff, but at the same time, they're having trouble paying, they're having trouble paying the bill, they're also having trouble keeping lights on, but they have a roof over their head. They if they're having trouble, so far everything, I've got a long list, they're in an apartment, they have Wi-Fi, they have all these extras in their apartment, but they struggle to pay it, sounds like... It already sounds like they're living above the center of living because you don't have to have all those, like all those things that you're listing mm -hmm. are above the expected standard of living. So, so I don't hear relative poverty at all. I hear this. Give me, give me like a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so it can be possible, but yeah. I feel like if you have everything you need, but like you said, you're still like, when am I getting That's this. You have everything that you need. Relative would be like a woman and man working at their highest peak, but they can only afford water, electricity, and like the basic necessities. No Netflix or anything like that. No entertainment stuff or very like little. Making paycheck to paycheck to paycheck because they have a million children. And <laughs> yeah. And children are expensive, aren't that they? That would be like relative. Nobody tells you that, but those little critters are expensive. Yeah, so, um, but anyway, yeah, that, that sounds like relative poverty, but I like the way y'all's minds are trying to figure out these scenarios. That's exactly what um, Project 2 is all about, the, you know, the second 50-point project. The first one was the Alicia Keys thing, and this one is just scenarios about a fictional person named Mary. And actually, we don't have everything that we need for you to start that, so I'm not going to post it on Blackboard for you today. I will wait until Wednesday's lecture and video are done and posted and then make that available because we, on Wednesday, what we're gonna talk about, we will have to spend part of our time on Wednesday talking about human development and worldwide how these different levels of poverty, bless you, how these different levels of poverty, y'all wait for just a second because I'm screaming over your, um, your backpacking. So uh, anyway, human development, there is something called a human development index and it is a rating of different kinds of things that cause early death or cause success in life. Things like education, lifespan, healthcare, access to those kinds of things. So we're gonna look at that in, um, uh, in class on Wednesday and how these different kind, situations of poverty can affect your level of human development and how your level of human development affects this, okay? So um, it's good stuff, it's interesting stuff, it's sad stuff. We probably are gonna have a sad day on Wednesday, no, um, probably. But uh, that's what we're gonna do on Wednesday and then you'll be ready, okay? All right, so thank you very much for your attention and your conversation, it's always good, always good. <laughs>